Good morning. Morning. Hello, everyone. Buongiorno. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to the webinar Groundwater Facing a Common Challenge, organized by CETACUA in collaboration with the Universitat Politecnica de Valencia and the University of Pavia. During the interventions, please keep the microphone off. If you have any questions, you can ask them via the Teams chat. Now I present Marco Orlando from Prima Foundation. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. If not, please interrupt me, but I guess so. Uh, well, uh, again, I, I would like to start by thanking you, uh, the organizers, for, for this kind invitation. To be here today to, to listen from the Prima project. So thanks a lot to the Zetaqua team that worked to, to, to prepare this meeting. And also I would like to say hi to, to the, the, the coordinators of all the projects which today are going to educate us and, 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 and they're going to share stories on what work they are they are doing. Um, you know, so it's gonna be very interesting. Uh, for this reason, I, I don't really want to be long in my intervention. I know that the, the the most interesting part of the webinar will be after the opening, so uh, I, I will not take a lot of time. Um, maybe I, I I would like to give some some background information and to to go back in time a bit uh, for the benefit of the the uh, the participants to this meeting that uh, uh, don't know much about the projects, uh, and, and obviously today will be a good chance to uh, to maybe learn about them. Well. These projects were 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 selected uh, 
a couple of years ago uh, in the framework of a call for proposals that uh, Prima launched in 2019. Uh, the, the topic is very obvious. It's uh, sustainable management of groundwater in uh, water stressed Mediterranean areas. This is what the, the four projects uh, focus on. Uh, and, and obviously, uh, we received as usual a big number of applications. Uh, uh, I think more than, uh, than 80 projects we received. And I think we selected uh, uh, four, only four, unfortunately, because we obviously we have to deal with limited funding. Uh, but yes, we select four projects that I guess uh, um, are excellent and and uh, most probably they, they are delivering some very important results to contribute to the objectives of this call. Um, it, uh, it's, it's obviously a call which tackles, as we said, uh, sustainable groundwater management. It's a very important uh, uh, issue for the Mediterranean region. Uh, we know obviously that Mediterranean countries they they share uh, some some common features, some some common uh, characteristics uh, like the climate, for example, because most of them uh, have a, an arid or semi-arid climate, and and obviously scarcity of water resources is another feature that all the Medi that we share in the Mediterranean region, most of the countries. So. Um, we know that we have to deal with uh, with water scarcity. That means that uh, the availability of water it it, uh, it it varies across space and time, and and there there are big differences also between the north and the south, the the, the northern and the southern shore of the Mediterranean. Um, so the, the the different countries are, are also subjects to different pressures, but still the problem remains for everyone. And uh, we are facing the Mediterranean is, in, is a hot spot for the climate change impact, and uh, uh, obviously this has uh, a great impact uh, on on water systems, agricultural systems. Uh, the the Mediterranean also is experiencing the the consequences of uh, uh, population growth, which is uh, increasing very fast, especially in the southern part of it. And this obviously creates a higher demand for food, uh, uh, an increase in agricultural production, and there are obvious consequences for uh, natural resources, including water, which are put under uh, strain by this growth. And uh, of course, uh, uh, when we talk about natural resources and water, we cannot we cannot uh, speak. We have to speak about groundwater, which. Um, of course, the groundwater resources in the Mediterranean are uh, the, 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 either the main supplier of, of fresh water or they contribute greatly to uh, supplying uh, uh, surface water uh, resources. So sources. So um, uh, of course we are uh, we are talking about uh, uh, an Im important resources, but also we have to be mindful that uh, uh, groundwater is exposed to a series of of uh, threats. Okay that uh, are related with the quality, both the quality and the quantity of groundwater. So um, uh, I, I think these, 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 for example, we can mention the, the over pumping, over exploitation due to what we were saying before, before the increased uh, uh, water demand in agriculture, but also other uh, sectors like industry and, and tourism, especially in summer. And um, um, there are um, obvious problems related also with the, the quality of groundwater bodies. Um, that may come, for example, for, for coastal aquifers from salinization, that is due to the intrusion of seawater, or uh, any uh, unsustainable agricultural practices which contribute to the, uh, the contamination of the, of the aquifers in the Mediterranean. So, very important resource, but also very big challenges and problems that we have to face. So, in this context, uh, what can we do? Uh, what can we do? Uh, with uh, research and innovation, obviously ca carrying out joint research and and also sharing knowledge and and experiences and uh, developing networks and uh, and synergies between uh, organizations based in the in the nor uh, in the in the in the north of the Mediterranean in the south in the east, it is of course necessary because the challenges are are are, are common and uh, and we have to work together to to overcome them. So. Uh, by doing this, we can for sure contribute to having more sustainable groundwater management, promote uh, more effective, uh, more sound uh, uh, water policies and water governance. So, of course, I believe that these projects uh, uh, perfectly fit with the uh, the scenario that uh, that I, I, I kind of depicted, depicted until now. And I'm really sure that today we will have a chance to see how over the past year and a half, uh, these four projects have worked uh, on these issues, uh, maybe in in uh, uh, you know different consortia with different partners, but of course coming from uh, the same area, uh, how they addressed these issues, how they are contributing to 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 potentially solving this this issue of how to better 
uh, manage groundwater, uh, we will hear about different visions, different, uh, um, you know, also from, from the technical point of view, what the projects are doing. Uh, and I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting session. So really, I'm not going to take uh, much more time. I, I'm really glad you gave me a chance to uh, to do this small introduction, and I, I really look forward to to hearing from you both the presentations of the project that I uh, more or less know, uh, but most importantly, the thematic session. So thanks a lot, and uh, the floor uh, I, I'll give the floor back to you to the the organizers. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Marco. It is time to know more about the Prima projects. First, we have the GoFund projects. Hi all, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is Manuel from Fetacqua. I'm going to share my screen to show you a little bit the uh, description of of Gotham project. Um, Can you see the screen? Yes. OK, perfect. So I am the technical responsible in the TACWA for water resources uh, department uh, or area. And I'm going to give you a, a brief description about both and projects, challenges, opportunities, and all the different um, aspects that Marco um, has said about the main challenges, threats, and how groundwater um, Sorry, how God Daniel is addressing these challenges and is participating in, in solving this um, this threat. Okay, this is uh, basic information about Gotham project. Key information: the title, the most important word in the title is governance. Um, we are um, working on a governance framework approach to evaluate. Um, and it's called the governance uh, groundwater in, in different aquifer. My colleague, uh, Damian Sanchez, will give you a, an example in, in one of the thematic sessions. Um, the idea of the, um, of the Gotham um, project is to develop a user driving tool um, that enable effective groundwater governance, um, taking advantage of the different knowledge uh, that the different user has about groundwater and the different perspective insight they uh, they have about how to better manage uh, groundwater in the um, Mediterranean area. Uh, this tool, um, as you uh, see um, in the coming slides, is is made up by six different um, modules or or tools. Um, of course, Gotham is funded by Prima Foundation. Uh, with a duration of 36 months, uh, initial uh, official start in April 2020 and uh, official ending in January 2023, with a budget of 1.6 million euros. Okay, okay this is a, a global picture about the Gotham Consortium. Uh, the Gotham Consortium is made up by seven partners, three of them from uh, European Union members, Spain, France, and, and, and Italy. From Spain, uh, there are three members, CETACO Andalucía, CETACO Barcelona, and University of Córdoba, where department. The project coordinator is CETACO Andalucía. Uh, the French um, member is GAC, GAT Group. The Italian member is Engineering. And we have also two associated countries, Jordan and, and Lebanon. Regarding uh, Jordan, we have NARC, um, the, uh, and also we have a, a, another Italian um, partner, ACU, that it, uh, that uh, it's the link between the North African countries and and the European countries. This is the key role of ICU to to play this role of connect, link uh, the North African partners with the rest of the uh, consortium. So we we have. Um, well, yeah, just a brief discussion. Um, engineering is uh, responsible for the um, data architecture of the platform I'm going to show you. GAC is responsible for building the communities of practices in each demo case and also for dissemination and communication. The analytics models, the different routines, model, algorithm, 
um, this task is um, uh, is led by uh, Tetaqua, Andalusia, and Barcelona, and also by uh, University of Cordoba. Um, uh, the replication of the solution uh, built in the Spanish demo case uh, will be replicated in Jordan and Lebanon with the help and support of uh, NARC and ICU. Okay, this, this, these are the main objectives of, of the project with a focus on, on developing a user driving, uh, with a focus on uh, groundwater governance framework that would be applied, scalable, and replicable in all the Mediterranean countries. Um, it is also uh, an important place in the uh, in the project to to work um, in a better um, um, comprehension about uh, groundwater functioning and groundwater water balance and water quality dynamics uh, um, in the aquifer. This is the foundation, the basis for for any other um, model uh, uh, based on artificial intelligence and modeling. The first things we we have to do is to uh to to make uh, a robust and, and and sound um groundwater characterization of of our aquifers um we have also as an objective um related to um how is the relationship the existing relationship between different explanatory variables affecting groundwater climate change um ground, existing groundwater pumping different water measures that form part of the, of the different uh, water plan in, in, in each member state, and how these explanatory variables influencing groundwater uh, functioning uh, may affect, uh, may influence uh, the aquifer's status in, in a quantitative and, 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 and chemical uh, way. Uh, we have also a um, specific objective related to an um, agronomic techniques, an agronomic uh, module to estimate agricultural water demand based on, on different economic variables such as ex export and, and market prices. Um, we uh, also use different earth earth detection techniques uh, to assess um, agricultural water demand, but uh, also to derive different um, uh, vegetation indexes uh, and, and others to, to build an early, early warming system for monitoring drought, and um, part of the variables um, of, of these early warming systems come from uh, remote sensing um, repositories. And, and last but not least, we have also an objective uh, related to uh, manage aquifer research tool to, to, to boost, to foster this uh, natural-based solution initiative in Mediterranean uh, aquifers. These are, these, um, are some of the expected impacts or KPIs uh, related to reducing the water balance uncertainty, the water uh, components of the aquifer budget uncertainty by more or less 25% also. Um, due to this better uh, understanding of groundwater functioning, um, we expect to increase water security and resilience in, in these systems. Um, in a more technical way, we are working on an online groundwater monitoring able to uh, assess um, the quantitative and chemical status of, of groundwater based on the methodology uh, arised by the Water Framework Directive. Um, the managed prefer uh, I, I said before, with specific focus on cost effective at high efficiency managed aquifer research, including different criteria, as I show you uh, later. And uh, G tool, Gothan tool, is made up um, by uh, different models, six models that I'm going to describe shortly um, right now. Okay. Before that, uh, just a brief um, um, Insight information about Gotham use cases. We have one Spanish demo cases in Almeria, southern Spain, Campo de Dalías. This place is known on the, as the Plactic Sea, with um, a high uh, percentage of its area covered by greenhouses. And uh, in the recent decades, uh, groundwater pumping has led to changes in aquifer behavior, functioning, posing a real challenge. To, to maintain the, the important and the huge agricultural activity 
of the region with their uh, corresponding socioeconomic impacts and benefits for the society. Um, at the same time, we have two replication demo sites, one in Lebanon, Hiat, and uh, other in Jordan, Hatarak Basin, Sarka, uh, also with um, over pumping and problem and, and, and water quality uh, threats. Um, this is um, the um, structure of work package. Uh, the first one related to with the objective of building these communities of practices in these demo cases led by GAC, GAC, our French partner. Um, we have also a, a standard work package uh, related to aquifer characterization, water system characterization, that is work package two, and a specific work package focus on agricultural water demand. The core um, and main work package, work package four, uh, in which all the tasks related to development, implementation, and integration of the Gotham tool are taking place. Uh, also, an important work package, um, the, the fifth work package, uh, with the goal of um, evaluate the environmental and social economic impact of, of Gotham tool implementation. And related to all of um, this uh, work package, the replication and transferability package uh, led by ICU and the North African uh, partners. And of course, with World Packet 7, dissemination and communication, um, that, for example, the webinar of uh, today webinar from part uh, or one of the activities um, of the World Package uh, specific. Okay, so the, the Gotham One tool. Minute, sorry. Yeah. Two minutes, please. Two minutes. Okay. okay. Um, we have. Um, um, our focus is on groundwater governance framework based on bottom up uh, approach um, with the final goal on trying to build solution models algorithms to, to learn term sustainable managed aquifer uh, taking their complexity in terms of water components and certainty, including uh, ground, groundwater reaches, natural groundwater reaches, groundwater exploitation, and how different stakeholders and affect uh, the final status of the aquifer. Okay. So this is the general structure of the G tool with the three typical components, data layer related to different data sources. This information will feed the different models, six models, and the results coming from this model will show uh, will be shown uh, in a service layer um, in, in terms of dashboard views, KPIs, uh, or always thinking on, on the different interests and, and insights uh, gathered from water users in the different workshop in the project. So quickly, um, this has uh, the different models. The first one module re more related with the water balance and water quality dynamics aspect uh, with, with three, three specific results, groundwater potential mapping, Groundwater budget recommender system and automatic hydrogeological um, hydrochemical characterization. The model three is related to the tool focus on managed aquifer research to be able to identify zones and areas suitable to, to these schemes. Model uh, two and model six is more focused on future status, predicting techniques, machine learning, and, and deep learning techniques to be able to, to identify groundwater pattern trends, predict the different uh, groundwater levels in the official control points for the coming month. Um, and this uh, model is also connected with uh, uh, Earth observation results to try to interconnect the land use, land cover changes uh, and their impact on the groundwater levels. And the final and core module of the platform is the groundwater response models in which we are trying to determine and to study the existing relationship between explanatory variables, climate, um, water balance in, in current status, water quality, uh, data collected by online sensor, um, how these uh, explanatory variables are connected with the groundwater bodies status. So we are trying to predict the groundwater status as a function of different expected changes in, in groundwater research, in groundwater extraction, um, and to try to determine in the future how 
um, will be the groundwater uh, but the status focus on the methodology um, exposed by ground uh, water framework directives so the, the idea is to um, to improve the, the current methodology to evaluate the groundwater status, uh, including um, aspects and criteria related to governance, and also including aspects and criteria regarding uh, the environmental services provided by groundwater. So um, just to, to finish, uh, um, this is one of the objectives of the project, to create communities of practices in each use case regions. And we see uh, this objective of one of, uh, of the strategic objectives because without stakeholder involvement, without uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, we cannot reach the effective and robust groundwater uh, governance that we are looking for. So thank you and sorry for the extra time I have consumed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Manuel. Secondly, we have the Reservio project. Good morning, everybody. I can share my screen. You see my screen? Yes. Um, then, um, I'm Claudia Mesina, I'm the coordinator of the Reservoir project. Reservoir means uh, sustainable groundwater resource uh, management uh, by integrating earth observation derived monitoring and flow modeling results. Then the key words of uh, this project are uh, sustainable groundwater resource management, earth observation and uh, flow uh, modeling. Uh, the project uh, start, uh, started in March 2020 and uh, will end uh, in uh, uh, February uh, 2024. Uh, we are eight partners. Some partner uh, belongs to academia, some other uh, are end users. Um, the partners come from different countries. In Italy, we have the University of Pavia and the University of Padova. In Spain, the uh, Spanish Geological uh, in Survey and the University of Alicante, the Dokut Seilul University in Turkey and the University of Jordan. Uh, the end user consists of the Consorzio di Bonifica di Secondo Grado per il canale Emiliano Romagnolo and the Royal Society for the Conservation of Nature, the Azraq Wetland Reserve. Uh, the group is uh, strongly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary because it comprises uh, different expertises uh, ranging from engineering geology, hydrogeology, geotechnical engineer, uh, numerical modeling, uh, remote sensing and uh, sustainable groundwater uh, uh, management. Then uh, the challenge of the project uh, uh, was already said by Mark Orlando. We have an increase of the water uh, demand uh, related to urban and agricultural uh, water. And uh, um, on the other end, we have also a climate change that will affect the timing and distribution of the water. Then the reservoir uh, um, try to provide a new product and service uh, like, uh, for example, monitoring tools for casting tools and management tools for a sustainable management of groundwater in some water stressed Mediterranean areas in Italy, Spain, Turkey and Jordan. Uh, we have uh, uh, four uh, objectives uh, uh, in agreement uh, with the goals of the 2030 Agenda. Uh, first objective is to develop uh, an innovative method for the hydrogeological characterization of the aquifer at a large scale uh, using low cost and non-intrusive data as the satellite based earth observation techniques. I think that this is the main uh, novelty of uh, the projects. Uh, the second objective is to integrate these uh, earth observation techniques into numerical groundwater flow and geomechanical models 
um, to improve the knowledge about the current capacity of aquifers to store, to store water, but also to improve the knowledge about the future response of aquifer uh, to natural and uh, um, uh, human stresses. Uh, this in agreement with the goals uh, six of the Agenda 2030. Uh, the other objectives are to enhance the knowledge about the impacts of agricultural and tourism activities on water source and to engage, of course, water management authorities in agreement with the other two goals of the Agenda 2030, climate action and the life on the land. We have four pilot sites, the Upper Guadalentin Basin in Spain, the Comacchio Coastal Aquifer in Italy, the Gediz Basin in Turkey and the Azraq Basin in, uh, in Jordan. They have been uh, chosen because uh, they are uh, very vulnerable to drought. They uh, were uh, subjected to an intensive exploitation for agriculture or touristic purposes. And of course, uh, we have uh, some data, some geological and hydrogeological data. Each pilot site uh, will answer to a specific questions. For example, the coastal aquifer of Comacchio is a reclaimed land. Um, uh, a large area is composed by lowland zone below the sea level. Um, it is uh, characterized by uh, a network of ditches, the man-made network of ditches, uh, that which supplies uh, water for agriculture. Uh, but uh, in uh, uh, the summer time, uh, we have an increase of the water demand due to the touristic activity on uh, the uh, on the coast. Um, the main problem is the seawater intrusion. Then uh, the, this site uh, will answer the questions how can groundwater resources be managed to avoid the seawater intrusion? Uh, the other pilot site is constituted by the Alto Guadalentin Aquifer in Spain. Also in this case, uh, the site is characterized by uh, agriculture activity. It, it was uh, declared overexploited in 1987 and uh, it has experienced the highest subsidence rate measured in Europe, up to 10 cm per year. Then in this case, the question to answer is how can groundwater resources be managed to avoid the groundwater over exploitation and the subsequent land subsidence risk. Uh, the other pilot site is the Gedit River Basin in Turkey. Um, it's one of the most important but also stressed river basin in Turkey. Also in this case, uh, the main activity is agriculture. And uh, we want to answer the questions, how can groundwater cells be managed to ensure sustainable use of groundwater? The last but not the least is the Azraq Wetland Reserve in Jordan. Um, it is a reserve of international importance. Uh, it is characterized by a very peculiar ecosystem. It is a, a wetland in a desert. It plays a very important uh, role for the local community, but uh, it has experienced uh, uh, an environmental disaster due to the over exploitation of the water and the wetland become dry. Then in this case, you want to answer the questions, how can groundwater resources be managed to preserve groundwater dependent ecosystem. Uh, the methodology is structured in five main phases. Um, in the preliminary scope statement, uh, we have analyzed the stakeholder requirements through a webinar and a questionnaire. And uh, now we have identified the current pressure acting uh, on the um, groundwater resources. Um, in the data collection phase, uh, we have constructed the conceptual model of the pilot site. Uh, then now we are in the research activity, the phase three. Uh, earth observation uh, processing will be done in order to quantify the spatial and temporal uh, evolution of the land displacement. We will use uh, Sentinel-1 images uh, and aid in SAR techniques in order to process these images. Um, uh, these uh, will be done in the work package three. Uh, the data will be then validated, the earth observation data will be validated and interpreted in the work package uh, four. And also a novel uh, methodology uh, will be developed for the hydrogeological characterization of the aquifer, combining groundwater and earth observation monitoring. Uh, the phase four corresponds 
two demonstration activities, uh, the work package five and the work package six. Groundwater uh, flow model will be developed and calibrated through uh, earth observation data, and the future response of aquifer system to global change will be uh, simulated. Uh, the phase uh, five is the piloting phase in which uh, the results of uh, the demonstration research activity will be used uh, to develop uh, gui guidelines uh, for groundwater uh, resource uh, uh, management. Then, uh, which are... One okay. minute, please. Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, which are the expected impacts of the reservoir project? Um, then, uh, first uh, product and service uh, concern earth observation uh, and hazard uh, products. Uh, we will provide the ground deformation maps of the pilot site. Uh, we will map the subsiding area, uh, and this is very important, especially for coastal area in which subsidence uh, added with uh, the sea level rise uh, can uh, give rise to flooding uh, phenomena. Uh, in this case, uh, our project uh, uh, support also the assessment and management of flood uh, in agreement with uh, the uh, European flood directive. Um, then we, we, this product and service are addressed to regional authorities, environmental agency and insurance company uh, that uh, study land use and regional planning and do risk management. Uh, other uh, product and service concern the groundwater. Then we produce a workflow to optimize groundwater flow model, a methodology for hydrogeological characteristics using earth observation um, and uh, this uh, earth observation uh, will be used also to quantify aquifer storage. Uh, this will, will be useful for river basin water authorities, hydrogeological companies, remote sensing companies and municipal industrial water supply economic system. The, the last products concern the estimation of a water management index scenarios to detect the optimal timing and quantity of groundwater abstraction for irrigation, irrigation purposes, but also for the protection of the wetland. And then uh, we uh, produce uh, guidelines for groundwater resource management that uh, can be useful for river basin water authorities or municipal and industrial water supply economic system. Then these are the contact and more information where you can uh, find more information about the project. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Third, it is time to the e groundwater project. Okay. Good morning, everybody. So, can you can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um. Well, so. Uh, I'm Manuel Pulido Velázquez, professor at the Technical University of Valencia, UPB, and coordinator of uh, eGroundwater project. And eGroundwater is um, is a project about uh, well, we have the same goal as as the other Prima project that uh, are presented this this morning. Uh, the same overall. A uh, goal is sustainable uh, groundwater management, but uh, our focus is more on citizen, the application of citizen science and ICT um, tools uh, for improving the um, assessment of groundwater resources, the modeling and the sustainable participatory management. So some basic information about uh, the project. The project is a four-year project with uh, an overall budget of 1.6 uh, million euros. And uh, we have nine partners participating from Europe and from uh, Africa. So uh, UPV is the, the project coordinator, but we have also uh, partners from France and we have uh, the Geological Survey of France, BRGM. We have CIRAT also uh, from France, CIRAT and INRAI, and they have a long um, history of participation with the African partners of the project. We have also two partners from Portugal, University oh, or Universidad de Dolgarve. Okay. Estoy estoy con una sesión. Uh, so there is... Sorry. One Continue, microphone, please. please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, yes, so I continue. And so we have two panels from Portugal, University of uh, Algarve and the Lisbon School of Economics and Management. Uh, two other panels from, uh, from Spain that are SMEs, uh, eCatalyst, and Visual Nafer, whose main goal is, is to help on the development of the, of the ICT tool and the platform. And then the two African partners are one from Morocco, is uh, the University of Adrar, uh, sorry, University of Menex in Morocco, and one from Algeria, University of uh, Adrar. So the challenge we face is that uh, we all know that one of the most critical issues in groundwater management is uh, data. Data availability is often a critical issue due to the um, inherent complexity of groundwater resources. So we always talk about the invisible, the slow and distributed groundwater resources that are under exploitation of a, a myriad of users uh, and is susceptible of uh, an accountable exploitation and, and pollution. So data availability is often a challenge uh, for groundwater management uh, and groundwater information is also crucial for, for aquifer assessment, for groundwater assessment and modeling and for develop, developing sustainable groundwater management strategies. On the other hand, we know that traditional information systems are usually based on point data networks and are costly to maintain and further develop, and they have a limited spatial and time uh, coverage. So the idea is to find alternative ways, innovative ways of increasing groundwater information. And the solution that we are proposing in, in eGroundwater is the design and use of what we call enhanced information system. So the main goal of the project is support the sustainable participatory groundwater management in the MET region through design, testing and assessment of this enhanced information system, uh, integrating citizen science and ICT tools. And this enhanced information system will be applied to improve our understanding of groundwater systems and on the other hand with the support of modeling and participatory tools like for example scenario workshops, serious gain etc. We want to engage the uh, key stakeholders in the development of sustainable groundwater management strategies. Uh, well, this main goal can be translated into seven specific objectives. So evaluate information system, uh, develop innovative tools to enhance the information system using four specific case studies, assess the impact of the information system in on groundwater assessment and modeling, develop uh, management strategies, analyze socioeconomic impact of those uh, improve uh, information, assess institutional transition and capacity building, and estimate the potential of the of the approach in uh, Prima countries. Uh, the approach can the concept of the approach can be well summarized using this this figure, in which on the one hand we have the collection of data, then we have the aggregation and analysis. And then we have the application of the data to groundwater management. So in the collection phase, minutes, we are please. sorry. Two minutes, please. Two minutes. OK, on the collection phase, we are going to combine citizen science. I will talk later on that about that on the thematic session with health observation technologies, techniques, sensors and of course, traditional system. We have four case studies, one in Spain, Requena Utiel, one in Portugal, Campina do Faro, uh, and uh, Oasis in, Al in Algeria, in the Sahara Desert, and um, an aquifer in Morocco. So um, you have more information on the four case studies in the, in the project website. And uh, in the thematic section, we describe what we have done 
uh, on the analysis of the use of citizen science in groundwater management. So we have produced a CAD test that will be presented by Elena, uh, discussing different aspects of citizen science and collective groundwater management, including a, a very interesting glossary because it's crucial to have common terms. We will uh, talk also about the phase of stakeholder engagement and the development of the focus groups to discuss uh, and co-design the tools. Uh, we are uh, starting to, to do this co-design process of the ICT tools. They will combine a web-based uh, tool with a mobile app to be used by the farmers, the main, the main user in most, most of the case studies. The, these are a few slides showing some, some uh, features of the mobile application to characterize the groundwater system, to characterize uh, the uh, uh, groundwater requirements for irrigation. And we are using a, a procedure to estimate uh, assessment and forecasting of irrigation, water use and needs. I will talk later about about uh, about this in the thematic session. Um, finally, uh, we are developing modeling tools that are included or embedded into management models in order to analyze uh, groundwater management strategies. And finally, we have been developing some communication tools for the project. So here you have a reference to the project web page and the Twitter account um, where you can find more information about, about the project. We also develop a visual identity and common uh, layout and templates for the project and also an initial set of communication materials that we are going to expand in the, in the, in the next month. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. Finally, we have in the MED project, and I'm going to share with you my screen because we have a video. Imagine a groundwater manager sitting in front of the computer with a window open to a website with questions about the response of the aquifer to a reduction of infiltration in a dry year could be asked and answered almost instantly. Imagine a farmer in need of introducing a new fertilizer who could query the same website and know the impact that a given load will have on groundwater quality. Imagine a hydrogeologist building a numerical model to analyze the impact of some dewatering wells who is in need of historical data about the evolution of piezometric levels in the aquifer and being able to get those data instantly online and at no cost. Imagine a citizen, any citizen, yourself, concerned with climate change and interested in the evolution of groundwater reserves in the region and obtaining this information from the cloud. Imagine innovative, sustainable management of groundwater in the MED. Stop imagining, because this is in the MED, a project aimed at providing the most innovative decision support system tools to be demonstrated and applied in selected case studies around the Mediterranean. A project also aimed at fostering the sharing of data, methods, and results, making sharing the rule rather than the exception. Tools solidly founded in the most advanced system processes and socioeconomic models and the participatory involvement of all stakeholders, from water authorities to end users, from hydrogeology experts to total system analysts. Imagining in the med is imagining a better understanding of groundwater, better groundwater resilience, a new way of modeling, management, and remediation, and a new manner of understanding decision support systems. Always aim at ensuring groundwater sustainability in water stress areas in the Mediterranean.
You are mute. Okay. No. Now, uh, am, am, am I sharing my screen? Yes. All right. Okay, so that was a, a short uh, clip that uh, we put together for the Green Knights uh, organized in Tunisia and uh, in response to a query one of the partners in uh, in our project. Uh, and basically, it's it's that's uh, I mean it's it's the mid part, it's the main part, uh, the main objective of the uh, of the project to to build a, uh, at the end this decision support system that uh, can be used by anyone, uh, users, authorities. Uh, just uh, the public in general, and, and that can query what may happen in the aquifers that they are of, uh, of, of interest to them, uh, uh, just uh, in response to different activities, now, uh, having new wells, uh, re reduction of, uh, of uh, infiltration because of climate change, uh, and uh, I mean, whatever I mean, are the different actions that can change uh, uh, in time. Um, very quickly, I, I will complement uh, that uh, uh, that video. That, uh, as you could see, I mean, uh, I look very much like a salesman trying to just uh, make sure that everybody understood uh, what we are doing and that uh, and trying to to buy the, the product. Mm, uh, our project uh, in the Med, uh, this uh, innovative and sustainable groundwater management in the Mediterranean, has uh, seven partners and, and five uh, case studies. The partners are uh, from east to west. Uh, we have uh, the Instituto Superior Técnico in Portugal uh, that has the case study of Castro Verde, uh, the Technical University of Valencia in Spain with the Requena OTL uh, case study that happens to be the same case study that uh, Igran Water is, uh, is using in Spain. Then we have uh, UFZ in Germany, uh, the University of Parma in Italy, the Water and Technology Center in, uh, in Tunisia that uh, provides the Grand Valley Aquifer. Uh, then uh, the, University, the Technical University of Crete in, uh, in Greece that uh, provides the Timpaki uh, case study and uh, Bogadishi University in Turkey with the Konya uh, case uh, study. The, uh, the project is, is, uh, is basically is, is, is founded in these four pillars that you see here. Uh, the, the aim at the end is, is, is this uh, decision support system uh, uh, that uh, will allow uh, the user basically to very quickly uh, query what may happen in your aquifer uh, in response to different uh, activities. And, uh, and the, the first pillar is the one related to data that I also mentioned in the video. Uh, we want to basically mm, gather as much data as possible in the Mediterranean region, uh, make analysis of this uh, data to find uh, trends and, and, and correlations uh, uh, on that and uh, try to connect uh, all the available databases uh, uh, in one single place so that uh, all the data is, uh, is uh, easily accessible, freely available to anybody who, who needs to gather that information. The second pillar has to do with uh, basically this uh, participatory approach. I mean, we need to get all the stakeholders uh, uh, to know about uh, groundwater and uh, that groundwater is, is a renewal, is a renewable resource, but it's not an infinite resource. And uh, the only way to, to make sure that we can, we can keep uh, using this renewable resource is by and making sure that we do a sustainable management of uh, of the aquifer, and the third pillar has to do with uh, just basically the modeling, uh, the strategies for modeling and uh, potential remediation of the aquifers that have been uh, uh, polluted. So those uh, those four pillars, as I mentioned, uh, they they are connected through this uh, uh, stakeholder engagement, this uh, participatory approach in the five case studies that uh, I mentioned. And that quickly uh, are summarizing this uh, slide here. Uh, you can see, I mean, the, the, the very interesting thing about our case studies is that they, they are very, very general. I mean, they are very different. And uh, we are sure that we are going to be able to come up with some kind of uh, upscale rules that uh, should be applicable uh, beyond uh, the, fake case study, the five case studies that we are uh, analyzing. As you can see, the size of the of the aquifers go from a few tens of square kilometers to 62,000 kilometers in, in Turkey. The population that is served by these aquifers goes from a few thousand to millions of people. Uh, some of the aquifers are inland, some of the aquifers are in, in the coast uh, with the specific uh, problems that are 
related to these uh, these positions. In general, the climate is is arid, uh, semi-arid uh, climate, as you can see. I mean, uh, the precipitation only in Castro Verde is a little bit higher than 500, but it's uh, below 500 millimeters per year uh, in the rest of the uh, of the sites. The use <coughs> the use of the of the water is uh, very variable. Uh, it, it goes from agriculture uh, <coughs> to urban uh, use, mining use, uh, even tourism uh, usage. So we have different, uh, different, as I said, different usages for the for the water. All of the all of the aquifers, except for the Portugal uh, one, it's uh, are overexploited. Uh, you you can see this decline of uh, of uh, levels uh, continuously during the last few years. And uh, uh, all of the, all of them, except for the Rakeno TL, have some kind of uh, pollution problem, either related with nitro contamination or uh, water intrusion from uh, from uh, uh, from the sea, and or in the Turkey case, just uh, salinity because it's it's a close, it's an endorheic uh, basin, and and you have this uh, increase of salinity uh, induced by uh, evaporation. And, uh, and also, I mean, and the third one, uh, the Castro Verde one in Portugal, has problems with uh, with mine wastes. There were packages that are yes. there are seven work packages. Pardon me. Two minutes. Okay, work packages uh, are uh, uh, there are seven work packages. If you remove the first uh, and the last one, which is the management and the dissemination, basically there is one package for each one of the pillars that I mentioned. Plus uh, package number three with this uh, smart modeling that uh, it's it's uh, 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 a package that uh, will feed basically all the other packages. I mean, all all the other packages at some point need some kind of modeling that uh, uh, will be used later uh, for whatever is the purpose of those uh, of those packages. I have already mentioned which are the partners that uh, are involved uh, in the project. Uh, this will be a picture that summarizes uh, the, uh, the in the med project uh, with uh, the groundwater. I mean, the saturated area with all the work we are doing, the, all the stakeholders uh, basically on the surface, and in the unsaturated area, we have the different uh, processes and models that uh, we are going to be using just to connect both the users and and the groundwater and try to to make them uh, talk to talk together and understand what's uh, going on. About the timetable, I, I'm not going to enter into any details, just to say that uh, the COVID situation has really put a uh, big stress on uh, trying to meet the deadlines that uh, we set up right before the starting of the of the project. The project started right on the outset of the of the COVID crisis, and uh, and we will certainly will need to ask uh, with our midterm uh, report uh, a short extension uh, to be able to meet uh, the goals that uh, we we proposed originally. And that's all. Thanks very much. Thank you. Now we turn to the thematic sessions. The first one is related to health observation. Thank you, Beatriz. And uh, I will start the first uh, session. Uh, as already said, uh, uh, the data availability is an obstacle for uh, groundwater uh, management. Uh, generally, the hydrogeological aquifer characterization is carried out through uh, in-situ tests uh, or uh, laboratory tests, uh, but generally they are uh, very expensive, uh, maybe sometimes uh, time consuming, uh, and we obtain a measure uh, only of a few points, then uh, there are not uh, very good uh, and useful uh, if you want to characterize water resources at a large scale. Earth observation technology can help fill this information gap by assessing and monitoring water reserves at uh, adequate temporal and spatial scale. And uh, we will uh, present uh, now two uh, applications of earth observation in uh, our Prima projects. The first uh, concerns the reservoir uh, project um, in which uh, uh, Pietro Sorry. of Sorry. Your, Yes. Are you sharing your screen? 
No, 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 I'm not sure. Okay. I just talk. <laughs> uh, then I, um, Pietro Teatini and uh, Carolina, uh, Pietro Teatini of the University of Padova, Carolina Guardiola Alberto of IGME, uh, will present uh, the, um, the use of uh, adding our products uh, uh, in a reservoir project. And then uh, we have also another use of earth observation products by IGRA Water Project. Then please, Pietro, you can share your screen. Okay, so good morning to everybody. Okay, I hope that you can uh, see my screen. So, yes. the, good. So, the, the idea is to present right now very quickly which are the methodological approach that we uh, we want to apply in, in a reservoir project in order to improve groundwater uh, characterization using earth observation. So the, the topic is, of course, related to aquifer system, and, and we know that in the Mediterranean basis, a lot of uh, fresh water is used for, from several, in several countries in order to supply fresh water. But this causes aquifer overexploitation, and which are the main consequences of aquifer overexploitation? The first one, of course, is let's say the lowering of the water table or, or the piezomatic head in, in our aquifers. And a second one is the, a decrease of soil capability to store groundwater. And this is really a big problem. And this is strictly related to the third uh, effect that it is also a lowering of the land elevation, what we generally call land subsidence. So we, the idea is let's try to use this kind of information, so land subsidence measurement, in order to improve uh, how the, the possibility that we have uh, to characterize the storativity of our So land subsidence now can be measured with um, uh, remote sensing observation with very high accuracy and in a very, let's say, using SAR uh, interferometry, and these use images that are now, uh, let's say, available at a low cost. The methodology is non-invasive, so we do not need to drill any, anything in the field. And we have the capability and the possibility to investigate very wide areas, so very, uh, let's say, hundreds of square kilometers with using SAR methodology. So, SAR methodology is based on using these uh, satellites that are, uh, that mounts, that, oops, sorry, that as, um, seven. okay, that, that has the possibility, let's say, to measure very accurately the movement of objects that are located on, on the land surface. So, if you look at the picture to the left, you can see that a satellite that mounts these uh, radar um, sensors has the capability to measure, let's say, the movement of, for example, of an houses or other objects that are uh, located on the, answer, on the land surface over time, simply looking at the difference of the, let's say, of the response uh, of the radar signals that are sent from the satellite to the land and then return back to the satellite. So in this way, even though the satellites are very high, 800 kilometer, they, they fly at 800 kilometer, let's say above the land surface, we are able with this methodology to measure displacement that are on the order of few, few millimeters. So they are very, very accurate. There are several satellites, if you look at the picture on, on the right hand side, that has been, let's say, used up to now since the early 90s. But the, the, we are now focusing on the most, uh, let's say, recent satellites that are uh, managed by Copernicus, so Sentinel-1A uh, and Sentinel-1B. These, uh, these data are managed by the European Space Agency. They provide free data. So, and, and they cover very uh, wide images, so that they are perfect uh, for, for, our, for our topics. 
So we we have let's say the, the 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 each picture let's say like this each photo of our land surface is on the order of 100 kilometer in size so we can really cover very very big area and uh, why why this is important because let's let's um, if if we consider an aquifer okay and we start uh, over exploiting so pumping groundwater for for every kind of of purposes what we uh, generate into the aquifer is of course a movement of the groundwater toward the wells so we have let's say a change of the pore pressure fields and and this uh, can be in some way um, simulated using if we look on on the left part we we can simulate this through through models that uh, solve the classical groundwater flow equation where we have the pore pressure p and we have two key parameters one is k the hydraulic conductivity of our aquifers and then we have ss that it is the store the uh, storage or storativity of the aquifer it represents how much water the aquifer can provide or can cap. But the, if if we look on, on another parameter, so if we move on the right hand side, we have that when we pump water from an aquifer system, we also generate a movement of the land surface, this so-called land subsidence. So the green, the, the red arrow, so the land surface goes down. And we can measure this uh, uh, lowering at a very with this uh, on this very wide area using uh, this insal methodology and land subsidence the, the the very simple equation that it is provided on the bottom uh, right side of this image land subsidence is directly related to ss to the aquifer storage okay so land subsidence give us the possibility to directly um, quantify the storativity of the aquifer in a much more, let's say, easy way than the groundwater, uh, uh, the groundwater equation, where the storativity is linked only on the pressure variation. So this is the idea. Let's use this direct link between land subsidence and storage in order to characterize these fundamental properties of our aquifer system. We use this in a, in a quite complex uh, modeling framework because we want also to take into account uncertainty, uncertainty in the model, uncertainty in the knowledge of our subsurface system. So the idea is let's try to develop what, what are generally, generally now called data simulation algorithms. So methods that uh, put together the uncertainty that we have in the modeling tools with the uncertainty that we have in the measurements and the uncertainty that we have in the in the aquifer geometry in order to provide not only one result so the, our uh, goal will not be to to provide one storage value okay for an aquifer but uh, rather than a sort of distribution so a probab a probabilistic distribution of the properties that give us the possibility to also to, pro to, to have an, an estimate on the uncertainty of our of our prediction. The models can be will be uh, very different. We will have four sites as as Claudia Mesina has shown you at the beginning and depending on the data availability, we will have the possibility to play with different types of model, more simple such as layer cake model, multi aquifer system models, or also heterogeneous models that take into account, let's say, facies distribution. So each site will be uh, will be investigated through different kind of numerical models, depending on the availability of information that that uh, we we will have. And to close this, just a couple of examples that where where this tool has been, let's say, already implemented in a preliminary way. The, this is the site in Alto Guantalentin case study. So we are in Spain and you can see here it, how we, let's say, we are able using this cell interferometry methodology to capture uh, in, a, in a very detailed way the movement of the land surface of all this valley and we, with a lot of information and we, let's say, and without any in-situ measurement. And this is very fundamental because give us the possibility 
to improve a lot the, the, our knowledge of the relationship between the piezometric evolution and, and the deformation. And this gives, it's, it's very important to characterize the aquifer system. And another, a second application that has been carried out also in Spain, this is for an, um, the Madrid aquifer, so an, an aquifer that supply water to, to Madrid, to the capital of, of Spain. And also in this case, SAR measurement has been used together with groundwater flow model and, and geomechanical model in order to characterize the, the elastic properties and, and, so, and therefore the storativity of the, and the capability of this aquifer to store water and of course to release water as soon as, let's say, the, the, the city the city will will need more 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 water during mainly during the the drought period and that's all for my side thank you pietro and then uh, manuel if you wanted to to present uh... um well i have i have just two questions because um uh, I'm, we are using earth observation, but not with this focus uh, on subsidence uh, rigs and analysis. We are we are using earth observation as a, um, data sources for for feeding the uh, the managed aquifer research tool to identify potential areas to implement um, managed aquifer research schemes. And um, some of the variables we are working on are based on satellite based on uh, land use, land cover, um, and also digital elevation model and, and so on. And we are also using earth observation techniques to evaluate um, and assess uh, agricultural water demand using a uh, water um, energy-based model, the DSEP um, um, algorithm to estimate uh, um, actual evaporative aspiration for different crops to try to understand the water use, the groundwater use in the different and case studies. But, but uh, focus on these topics, that this is a really interesting topics, uh, the use of Sentinel-1 to try to, to better understand groundwater functioning, groundwater numerical uh, modeling and so on. I wonder if, if can we estimate in some way groundwater volumes uh, that are being pumped from the aquifer from this, um, Techniques. So, or, or we can uh, just find correlation between water levels and subsidence, but not with uh, groundwater extraction. Well, if it is a question to me, no, let's say with, through, through, with this methodology, we, we really do not have a direct evaluation of, of the pumping rate. The, mm -hmm. No, this is so we have to pass through a model. So the mm -hmm. idea is okay, let's let's use this kind of information plus uh -huh. plus what we know the subsurface in order to yeah to derive this sort of information. Yeah, but okay. not to measure. But this this also enable to 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 build a, a better groundwater flow modeling in mud flow, fee flow. Yeah. Okay. Yes, because because in the aquifer in a, in a groundwater flow model you have to put uh, the elastic storage. Okay, and and that mm -hmm. parameter is really let's say important because it's it's let's say it's one of the two parameters together with the hydraulic conductivity that govern the the the. the Let's say the, the groundwater flow equation. So th this is why it's it's uh, in, it gives mm -hmm. us the possibility to, to improve our modeling approach. Okay, perfect. I, I just wondering how the the results coming from from these subsidence models can be used for end users, water managers, water regulators, or they are results more thinking on uh, uh, research academia. Um, it is an interesting. Um, uh, results, but I, I see a gap right now. I'm not an expert, no? but I see a gap from the usefulness of these results, um, the final water measure that are included in the water plan of a basin um, in, at a basin scale. So, but um, that's my opinion. Uh, 
But I, I so interested in, in this methodology that I will also add some answers to show if we can apply these um, techniques in our case study in, uh, in, in Gotham project to see how, uh, or in other project or proposal. So thank you so much for the explanations. It's quite interesting. Thank you. About the pumping rate, maybe is uh, uh, in the futures. I think that uh, I don't know in literature if uh, someone has already tried to obtain a pumping rate uh, from interferometric uh, data, but I think that it will be a challenge in the futures if uh, uh, we know uh, the um, variation of the piezometric level. Uh, maybe inverting the model, uh, but this is a challenge. I think yeah. that uh, we have to study more about uh, that. I think that there are a lot of things that we can obtain through uh, this interferometric data. Obviously, there are uh, some uh, limitations due to the fact that we need to have a subsidence phenomena, but obviously we apply in area where we have uh, groundwater uh, over, over exploitation, uh, then it seems to be very useful for groundwater uh, management. And then, uh, yeah, thank you, Claudia. I agree. Yeah. Manuel, do you want to say something? Um, yes, um, maybe I can share, I, I can quickly share my screen and show the approach we are following in our e groundwater project. And particularly in the, can you see my my screen? Yes. So that's particularly in one case in the project is in Requena Utiel, um, the one in Spain. So we are using earth observation for monitoring uh, water use and water requirements. So basically, we are first estimating the irrigated area. So in our case study, the main the main crop is uh, vineyards, and we want to differentiate what is the area that is irrigated from the non-irrigated area. We also are using earth observation in combination with other techniques to estimate crop requirements. And then related to the question by Manuel, uh, we are planning to use also the combination of earth observation and field data uh, and um, to estimate groundwater extraction and has has been done in the past uh, and, and I will show some very quickly you know? so for mm -hmm. the, the first part what we are doing is the estimation of the irrigated area so mm -hmm. we know the the surface area for vineyards but we want to determine which one are irrigated and, and non-irrigated so we have done so far with very good results combining both the remote sensing and, and machine learning tools. Uh, but we want to improve the results with uh, additional uh, field data. So basically, this is a, the an schematic of the methodology we are applying. So we are using satellite information and for field data um, in, a, in a collaboration with the uh, Valencian uh, irrigation service of, of the uh, region of the community of Valencia. We we have installed uh, an eddy covariance uh, device uh, to to improve the analysis of the uh, vertical fluxes in order to have the energy balance. And we are also um, including the weather forecast so that we can provide some useful information to the farmers on a forecast of irrigation requirements to improve their irrigation. There is a new robot that uh, are now used um, in some experiment and some new projects to characterize uh, or to improve the collection of field data in vineyards with ultras ultrasonic sensors and multi beam lidars and all this that will improve the, the information. No? So crop water requirement, this is the, the approach we are planning. As, as, as I said, we are uh, combining some precise field data with devices like Edico variants. So this uh, robot will be used in the next irrigation season. Uh, 
And uh, yeah, so that will be to the for the estimation of water requirements and for the estimation of water consumption, we need to complete this with uh, correlation coefficient with uh, field data and, and to see what are the, the differences between the water that is uh, needed and the water that is applied. No? We need to consider also that we have different types of, of, of uh, vineyards. Uh, so we need to consider the variety of the vineyards, uh, the crop type and the, the irrigation type as well. No? So um, we are, this is a work in progress, but uh, our goal is to use this information, uh, combining different sources of data in order to improve our understanding on how much water is needed and how much water is actually used in the in the aquifer, no, and uh, the idea is also to confront this, those results with uh, those provided by the farmers using uh, citizen science. So, for example, using the mobile app that we are developing, no, because we want to test also uh, the accuracy of uh, citizen science information and how compatible it is with other sources of of data. And that's it. Okay, thank you so, very much. Um, can I just ask you a question about the resolution of the uh, satellite image that then uh, that you use? And another thing is about uh, the soil water content. Uh, so in this case, uh, you use uh, satellite products. Mm -hmm. Okay, about the resolution. Do you want um, Esther or, or Miguel Angel, Miguel Angel Jimenez? Do you want to comment on that, Esther? Hi, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. we can hear yeah. you. For the resolution, we are using 10 met meters from Sentinel-2. Mm -hmm. um, and about uh, the soil moisture, uh, which uh, satellite you use, which product you use? We are using Sentinel-2 with uh, Optram model. It's a, a model that, uh, re, that do relationship between infrared and soil moisture. Okay. Thank you for uh, your explanation. You're welcome. I don't know if uh, there are some questions in the chat. Uh, Beatrice, uh, we have time, uh, I don't know. No, but we haven't got enough time. <laughs> no. Okay. So now we are going to talk about different modeling approaches to infer the quantitative and chemical groundwater status. Okay, thank you uh, very much uh, for the introduction. So basically, I'm going to be talking about modeling groundwater, even though Pietro has already uh, talked a little bit about modeling and, 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 and the importance of modeling and, and how uh, you should uh, choose your model, uh, I mean, depending on which are the goals. Because at the end, I mean, a model has only sense if you know exactly what you are going to use, uh, use it for, uh, depending on what you are going to be using the model for the data requirement, uh, the process that you have to include in, in your modeling uh, are going to be changing. Uh, very, very quickly, uh, what an aquifer model will uh, provide you is a quantitative framework to just uh, basically analyze how the aquifer system is, uh, is evolving. Uh, this, uh, this numerical model that uh, we all are, are, are seeking uh, will be based in some conceptual model that uh, will be the qualitative uh, uh, first uh, model, but at the end you, you need this uh, numerical model to do quantitative analysis. It's a very good well to synthesize all the information that has been uh, gathered and uh, it will allow you to conceptualize uh, all the hydrologic processes that uh, will affect uh, uh, whatever is the, the process or the, the reason why you are building uh, that spe specific model. 
some, some people may have asked, I mean, why model? And, and, and besides the fact that uh, the European Water Directive already requires that all the water uh, masses, I mean, all, all the aquifers do have an aqu a model behind uh, basically to answer questions about uh, the management of, of the of the aquifer. The, the answer is what else? Uh, I mean, uh, if we don't model, what can we do? Uh, the truth is that the subsurface is hidden and uh, its analysis is uh, is hampered by limited field observations. We have already mentioned that uh, data is scarce uh, and uh, I mean, the only the only data avail availability in abundance is the one that you can get from satellite uh, uh, information. So considering that the model is the most the defensible description of a groundwater system when you have to present your results and, and defend it be before the public or before uh, the authorities. And, uh, and, and you can use it just to make a quantitative analysis uh, as well as forecasts about the consequence of uh, proposed actions. If uh, we can classify the models into types, physical and mathematical, we are not going to be talking about physical models, which would be basically laboratory tanks or, or laboratory experiments. Uh, we are going to be working mostly on mathematical models. And of this, uh, there are two types of models, uh, in particularly in the, in the metrology, we will be used both uh, data driven models, uh, which are black boxes. I mean, there is no process understanding about it. It's just uh, based on uh, statistical descriptions or empirical relationships between uh, the input data and the, and the output and the, and, the, and the expected output. Typical example would be uh, the response of a karst aquifer of a spring in a karst aquifer uh, in response of uh, a, a, a rainfall event. Uh, this is, I mean, you can, uh, it's very typical just to, to train an artificial neural network to be able to provide you the, the groundwater flow in the spring as a response of uh, a piece of, I mean, a rainfall, a rainfall event. And uh, the other type of uh, mathematical models will be process driven or physically based in which we use uh, the, we understand the processes that are happening and we understand the, the mechanics and the physics behind those processes. The models can also be classified, and, and I would like, uh, if we have some time, uh, to discuss a little bit about this uh, on deterministic and stochastic. Uh, deterministic assumes that you know everything about the aquifer system, which is never true. And uh, the stochastic uh, basically wants to account for the uncertainty. And uh, at the end, the accounting for this uncertainty means that there isn't a single answer that is correct, I mean, that is consistent with information uh, given. We are still too much used to using uh, deterministic models and just provide one answer. But the, the truth is that there is a lot of uncertainty and there is a need to account for, for this un uncertainty and to quantify it. In between data driven models and uh, uh, models, uh, models uh, based on, on processes, there are the surrogate models. The surrogate models uh, are basically data-driven models, but uh, that have been built uh, using for the training or for the just yes, building this surrogate uh, using uh, process-based models that uh, will train this uh, this uh, surrogate uh, model. And and uh, the, the the work package, the specific work package that we are talking uh, about uh, these meta models or surrogate models, uh, what. Uh, mm, uh, mm, Six is uh, is just basically very simple models that uh, can be used in this decision support system that uh, I mentioned to you earlier, so that you can query very quickly uh, the the aquifer, the system, and say how the system is going to answer without having to run a full uh, mod flow or fee flow model, but uh, just uh, use simple relationship that like the ones derived from an artificial neural network. Sorry. I yeah. think you are in the second slide. We can see the next one. In the second slide? Yes. Uh, well, I have been, uh, well, I, I went through many, many slides. So if this is great, so you haven't seen anything of what I, I was talking about. Uh, I'll share again. Okay. Are you seeing you seeing why model? 
Yes. 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 Okay, so, well, I already told you why model what else. Uh, I told you the typical kinds of models. And uh, as I mentioned, I mean, mathematical models, the ones we're going to be using, uh, I would like to discuss, if possible, uh, this issue of uncertainty related to stochastic models. And uh, and then uh, just to mention to you that we have these uh, surrogate models that are simple models that are based, I mean, are, are data-driven models which are based on on, uh, on process-based models. Uh, I mean, we use process-based model to build the, uh, the surrogate models that uh, will be uh, later used uh, as a simplification of the of uh, of our aquifer in the decision support system. Just uh, uh, one example about the surrogate models, uh, which was uh, is part of the work that is being done in World Package Three by uh, led by the uh, by the University of Parma team. Uh, here, uh, what we have is just an aquifer. Uh, where we have some observations given by the by the crosses, and uh, and then uh, you see a, a, well, a pumping well uh, in the center, and uh, and you see well, but for a specific uh, pumping uh, extraction uh, in a specific recharge, you have a, a given distribution of the of the hydraulic heads that uh, you see on the right. The the question here is that uh, if uh, the purpose of our uh, decision support system is see is is, is try to uh, think I mean uh, analyze what will happen because of climate change and the reduction of infiltration in the aquifer uh, in in a very quick manner what we did was we trained this uh, uh, surrogate model to just give us the uh, response of the piezometers. Uh, for different uh, infiltration rates for different recharges in the aquifer and also for different uh, pumpings uh, uh, in the well. And uh, what we found is that uh, and, and the, the objective would be to predict the piezometric head uh, at the observation wells uh, as we change uh, the, the pumping or the recharge rate. Uh, we use uh, a couple of uh, different uh, surrogate models, artificial neural networks and, and random forest. And uh, what we find is that, uh, I mean, it's, it's very simple to train. I mean, uh, either one of these uh, two uh, uh, surrogate models, uh, and we can get uh, correlations of 0 0.999 for the case of the artificial neural, neural net and, and 0 0.97 for the random forest between prediction and observations. Okay, so, so what you would get from the full model and what you get from this very simplistic, very, uh, very quick to evaluate uh, model. We have done this also for uh, for transport. I, I will not show you the, the results, uh, both in the context of, of forward modeling, how a, a plume, how a, a contaminant moves uh, in an aquifer, and also uh, uh, from an inverse modeling approach, trying to find out, uh, trying to invert the location and the strength of a source given the concentrations observed down gradient. And, and again, we can build a, a surrogate model that is able to to predict, I mean, uh, uh, both which will be the, the plume in the future if we change the location and the strength and and, and the, the injection uh, that uh, is happening in the aquifer, or the opposite. I mean, just yes, to find out which is the source, changing the observations in the in the downgradient uh, uh, aquifers. Um, in the project in the med, we will be using uh, all three kinds of models, uh, process-based models. Uh, in those case studies where uh, either there is already a, a model in place or they, 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 were, they had plans to have a model uh, for the site uh, and it will be a process based i mean a full okay, mod flow st style uh, type of model there will be data driven models uh, for those uh, cases in which uh, there is no way that we can build a model i mean there is no enough information and uh, at the end what we will have is uh, is just basically data about uh, the evolution of the say piezometric heads in the aquifer or the discharge to the rivers or whatever is the output variable and some input variables like uh, uh, rain uh, in the area uh, surface crop surface i mean uh, uh, population and we will try to build uh, a, a data driven uh, we will try to find some kind of empirical relationship between those explanatory variables and the response variables to try to use them in the in the decision support models and uh, and we will use uh, surrogate models uh, as the basis for the decision support system, which needs uh, very fast uh, responses uh, to the questions that we may want to answer by by these models. And uh, that's what I wanted to say about uh, modeling groundwater. And uh, I would like, uh, I mean, if, if we can have a little bit of uh, discussion about some of the aspects uh, of modeling uh, in, uh, in these complex uh, cases.
So I don't know if any one of the uh, other PIs from the from the other pro projects wants to to say anything. Yeah, maybe I can share briefly my screen to show you um, the most predicted models. Uh, focus on some of the different approaches that Jaime um, has said, um, and, and just use this slide to to open a, a discussion. Uh, with the rest of the audience and with, of, uh, with the rest of the, the PIs. Um, because this is also a, a, another interesting topic, how to uh, combine in an effective way the black model and the white models to be able to get a, a green models or a surrogate model, as if I understood well your presentation, Jaime. The surrogate model will be a combination of black box and white box. Um, the surrogate model is a, is a black box model because it uh -huh. uses a relationship which will be empirical, but those relationships are built using process-based models. Okay. Yeah. So some uh, some black, I mean, as the, the, the model I mentioned about the, the karst aquifer, I mean, you, you actually don't do any, any, any process modeling. You just observe the historic, uh, say, flows from the spring, uh, and you compare that history with the history of rainfall and trying mm -hmm. to find out some kind of uh, relationship between those two variables without any process model in between. The surrogate model uses the process model to make this prediction, okay, so just basically to, to mimic, uh, say, synthetic uh, uh, responses of the aquifer to different uh, pumping, to different recharge, to different to variations mm -hmm. on the lateral incomes from a different aquifer. Mm -hmm. But uh, the data, the, the input variable and the output uh, uh, response, they are built on the basis of a process-based model. And then you forget about uh, the model, you forget about the mod flow, whatever is the model you use, and try to build this relationship between the input and the output. Okay. And, and okay, so um, in, in, in order to incorporate these process based models criteria, what is the minimum information you need from your aquifer to, to include this process base? I mean, you need um, a minimum set of transmissivity values, or you mean you need, you a, need a model? You, you, you need to build the model for the for the aquifer. You need to have oh, you, a, need, you need a, a, a yeah. okay, affinity elements uh, such as all flow yeah. and. Okay, so, so, you, so, you, so you, need, you need to to know the geological structure, the different layers, and and this type of information that always is is not needed or is not uh, available. You know. Yeah, otherwise you will be just directly a, a data driven uh, uh, model, a black box model, mm -hmm. the input data and the output data, which we will be that's what we'll be doing in the in the Turkey aquifer because it's too large and it's impossible. Okay, uh, okay, uh, as such. So okay. in that case, you don't, I mean, there is no process uh, behind it. Just uh, there will be just a statistical relationship between mm -hmm. the input and the output data that uh, uh, you want to uh, use for for the predictions. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, just to mention, what our approach is yeah, typical black box uh, data driving models. So with the objective of predict the um, pressurimetric heads in the different control point in in uh, in some piezometers. In this graph, in the graph. Uh, contained in, in, in module two box. Uh, this is a real groundwater levels series coming from different uh, piezometers in Campo de Dalias aquifers in southern Spain. Um, and we are building a matching deep learning model, combining different models, as you mentioned, combining random and also neural, um, XG boost. And okay, with, with the objective of building a uh, ensemble of models to try to get the the best of each one um, and to try to predict for the coming three uh, 12 months um, what will be the the, the evolution of, of the um, groundwater levels um, we are also collecting different data sources as, as input layers um, the most typical ones and uh, rainfall series accumulated rainfall series as well um, evapotranspiration, groundwater pumping regimes, and also we are incorporating some uh, time series coming from uh, satellite, so, uh, such as the evolution of, of black uh, surface in, in Campo de Dalias, such as the evolution of NDVI index, uh, just to try to, to see if some information coming from satellite uh, may be useful to understand uh, some of the behavior of the 
of the of the aquifer. And with the re, and with the result of this model two, we will try also to construct a, a more complex system to try to understand the different uh, relationship between um, uh, meteorological variable, hydrological variable, hydrogeological variables, um, the quantitative and chemical status as as they are defined in water in framework directive. As you know, to, to quantify the groundwater quantitative status, you you have to study uh, groundwater level trends. You have to study the groundwater exploitation index. That is the ratio between groundwater exploitation and, and um, groundwater natural research or available groundwater uh, uh, resources. And um, for the chemical point of view, you can you uh, may also check if different threshold water quality component thresholds such nitrates, pesticides are above or not of the legal um, limits. Just to understand if we can predict in the future uh, how will be uh, the groundwater body status and um, um, how uh, where we are so far from from achieving the good status um, um, that we need to be fulfill thinking on on water Franklin directive and thinking on the deadline of 2027 uh, for the different water plants so but this this last uh, module is more is a more uh, prospective um, um, model we are thinking on a conceptual way so right now but uh, each one is connected yeah Sure, sure. And, and in the machine learning algorithms that you can you can think, I mean, the deep learning uh, type of algorithms uh, can really find this very strange relationship between some of your explanatory variables and the, and the output that you are after. There have been a couple of questions, uh, not simple to answer. Uh, in the chat, uh, there is uh, Alper from uh, Doxul uh, University. He mentions that uh, uh, surrogate models are also being used for water quality modeling in rivers for sure. Uh, surrogate models are used, uh, uh, I mean, for many years. I mean, a very, very typical surrogate model is, is the, the, I mean, if, for those of you doing groundwater, is mod path. Mod path will be just yes, a surrogate for the full uh, advection dispersion uh, equation solution. Uh, you only saw the advection part. So it's a simpler model. I mean, basically, the surrogate model will look, looks for some kind of, kind of simpler model. But which is derived from the the true, I mean, true from the real process-based uh, type of model. Then there is a question by Saif uh, asking about uh, the strategy to select uh, uh, the best model. A again, the first, uh, the first, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to answer that uh, that question. The first, uh, the first thing that you you must really know is what you want the model for. So once you really know what the model is going to be used for. Then you can start deciding, I mean, uh, which is the complexity, the discretization, uh, which are the processes that uh, should be included in the model, uh, which data that you should be collecting. Uh, but the first question uh, I would say is to sit down and make clear what you are going to be using uh, the model for. And I think we we'll run out of time, so. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Jaime. <laughs> We are going to go to the third thematic session, and it is related to citizen science and ICT providing groundwater data. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. So can you see my screen now? Yes. yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so this thematic session is about the, the role of uh, citizen science and other ICT techniques in providing additional uh, information uh, on groundwater, so what we call the enhanced information system. So uh, what is the role of data in groundwater management? I, I mentioned that before, no? and as we have seen also in previous presentations, so data is essential, it's a key element in in groundwater modeling and in in groundwater management because groundwater management we cannot forget that for groundwater management we need to understand the groundwater system and for that purpose uh, modeling and, and groundwater assessment is crucial no but for that again the starting point is to have data no? we have some of the cases we are using in our project in groundwater in africa the data availability is really, really limited. So we need to 
they start almost from the scratch gathering of all possible sources of information and data in order to start understanding uh, the way the groundwater system works. And uh, groundwater data is not only a specific data on the aquifer, but also, uh, as we discussed before, is data on groundwater use, yeah, is data also on, on forecasting, is uh, data on many other uh, information that could be useful for the management of the aquifer. Um, so, um, data is crucial for the development of the model, it's crucial for assessing groundwater status, either for quantity or for quality. Uh, it's crucial for improving collective groundwater management. Uh, this is a very trending topic now, so uh, collective uh, groundwater management as a solution to the problem of the tragedy of, of, of the commons. Uh, in groundwater exploitation, um, and then, uh, but 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 data is also crucial for in better individual decisions, and and this is also uh, very important. So um, so data science or sci uh, citizen science uh, can be defined as uh, general public engagement in uh, scientific research activities involving science or contributing uh, with their knowledge, tools or resources. As I think the key term here is co-creation, co-create new scientific knowledge. That's the common definition. No? Um, in the case of water monitoring, uh, we have a, already a significant literature on what has been called community-based monitoring. So community-based monitoring is the use of citizens, public agencies, companies, academia, uh, other stakeholders, in order to uh, monitor, to track, and to respond to um, water management issues, okay? And we are always expecting a multidirectional flow of data. Okay. The users and the researchers, there will be a flow of information in both, uh, in both directions. Um, it's common to talk about different levels of citizen science. So you can go from the, the most simple ones, so crowdsourcing, so using the citizens just as sensors to provide, to directly provide data that then you will transform into information to uh, distributed intelligence in which you also use the citizens as, as interpreters. Uh, participatory science, the, the users will help also in the problem definition and in the data collection. So it's a co-design of, uh, of the strategy of uh, data collection and uh, extreme. So that will be the collaborative science. So. Uh, and also, you need to uh, find a balance between different citizen science goals. No? So you have, on the one hand, you have the scientific goals, uh, but then uh, you have to see what are the benefits to be provided to the different stakeholders. And then uh, what is the possible scale and depth of the engagement of the, of the users or the citizens in uh, providing the information? Um, and there, there has to be also a motivation for the citizens to participate in the process. This is something also we are studying in this project, no? in which we are going to uh, put in place this campaign to collect the data for the four key studies, and we need to really understand well what is the motivation for the users to contribute to the process. Uh, in the case of our project in e-groundwater, we have the collection, and I explained that at the beginning, the collection, the, the platform for the aggregation and analysis, and then the application together with the use of decision support system and groundwater models. Um, in our case, uh, citizen science will be facilitated by a mobile app, and the mobile app will uh, work in two, um, in two directions. So on the one hand, uh, the tool will 
provide useful information. Uh, the, sorry, the users, no, the citizens or the users will provide useful information for us uh, in the project. So they will provide, for example, basic information of their wells, uh, like the well location. It can be done by just by by taking a picture. Uh, basic information also the the type of pump, the efficiency of the pump. Uh, basic information also about their irrigated farm. Uh, and also to periodically report on groundwater use can be done directly on uh, the uh, the meters they have in order to tell us about how much water they are using and what is the, the groundwater level or indirectly, for example, providing the electricity bill that we will transform into groundwater consumption. Then we have also to provide some useful information to the to the users to the citizens because remember that there has to be a motivation for them to participate and one part of the motivation here to use the mobile app is that they will receive uh, useful information in exchange for example we are preparing information on meteorological forecast we are inform preparing information on crop requirements that i presented before and we want also to provide information on groundwater status. We want the users to know what is the evolution of piezometric levels in the aquifer in this year compared to previous years or compared to the mean of the previous years so that they can uh, see and understand that we are facing, is, uh, they are facing a situation in which uh, the aquifer is in a more critical status or not. And so, and they have to be uh, more aware of the condition of groundwater in the in the area. Uh, there, in our case, uh, this is going to be co-designed the, the 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 tools, the citizen science process, and the and the and the tools will are going to be co-designed with the users. We face some limitation because of the pandemic, but we are now on track uh, in this co-design process. And uh, my colleague Elena Lopez Gun, director of eCatalyst, um, she led the work on producing these card desks that are very, very nice tool to facilitate uh, the participatory work in the project, uh, providing information, example, and guidelines on the application of citizen science. And also, she will briefly talk about a Delphi survey that we are preparing. Uh, collecting information on citizen science and uh, data gap in groundwater management. So, Elena, can you can you yep. uh, share your yep. screen? Yep. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Manuel. Welcome, Elena. Okay. I'm just choosing my my screen. Uh, I'm not very good with uh... Manuel. Maybe could you share your screen? Yeah, yeah I can. So I think I it might be easier because I'm not so, very. Yes. Uh, I'm not so good on Microsoft Teams. <laughs> okay, so here, can you see the yeah the yeah. slides? Yeah. Okay, Elena, you tell me when you. when to pass okay. the slides. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so uh, we're we're going to present this is some of the the two things that we've advanced in the project that I think kind of provide a grounding on citizen science for the whole project. Uh, so next. So the two outputs that to us are, are kind of linked in, in many ways is first um, the card deck that Manuel just presented, which was really developed as a as a tool that had a, a purpose internally um, in terms of aligning everyone conceptually on the key concepts that we were using in the project. And we think that hopefully that, that happened, you know, what did we mean by enhanced information systems? What is the role of citizen science? Why? co-design with end users if we want our tools to be used is so absolutely critical. Um, and then we're now actually on the second output, which is actually the preparation of a, a global uh, Delphi survey. We think the first one on groundwater. Uh, so next. So the first thing we produce is Sakatec, which is really like a, a tool that you actually have to use with people. So we're not talking about ICT tools. This is actually something that is kind of hands-on, you have it in your hand. And we identified the, the five kind of key themes that under, underpin our project, uh, which is citizen science, the, the role of collective action in groundwater because it's a common pool resource, 
uh, what are the key issues, particularly in the Mediterranean, which is particularly um, pertinent because groundwater is such a critical resource in, in our countries. And then what do we actually mean by enhanced information systems and all these different tools that are now available, including people in a way as sensors uh, or as sources of information. And I'm not gonna go through the, through the, the whole diagram, but basically it's a process where on the one hand, you can use the, the deck card as a way of um, kind of in a way, capacity building for, for our end users, what is citizen science, why they are so important in the knowledge they have and in the possibilities that it provides to science if they share their knowledge with all of us because they have very valuable knowledge. And on the other hand, it can also be a way of co-designing a project which has citizen science at the core in the way it is designed. Uh, next. So what we produced was a, a set of cards. They're, they're kind of uh, size, they're slightly bigger than, than plain cards. And uh, as I said, they, they can be used both uh, to kind of um, introduce some basic concepts on what is citizen science. We have examples of collective actions from across the world, including Morocco, like for example, the aquifer contracts, um, but also to design your own citizen science project. Uh, next. And now we move into the to the next uh, thing that we're doing in the project, which is a, a Delphi survey. Uh, just to, to clarify what is a Delphi study, it's a, it's a foresight method. It's a bit like a kind of um, glass ball that you try to use to basically reduce the areas of uncertainty in the future and identify what are the main critical factors in the coming years on a specific topic. In our case, we, of course, chose groundwater. Um, we therefore have to ask questions to experts. So it's an expert survey as compared to the citizen science where you're really dealing with all kinds of knowledge. This is really dealing with expert knowledge. Um, as I say, to provide clarity on the areas of uncertainty and allowing a systematic co contrast on these most relevant trends. So we will assess you know, to what extent experts you know, coincide or the level of uncertainty is much higher or the level of disagreement is, is, is high or low. Uh, next. So, we basically, I was very pleased to tell Manuel that we now have the in-ground water survey ready. We're gonna test it out this week internally in our consortium. And we're going to focus again on the kind of uh, pillars of our project, which is really looking at what are the critical issues in the Mediterranean for groundwater, the importance of collective action, which we think is absolutely critical. Otherwise we don't think you can actually manage groundwater because of the nature of the resource. Um, citizen science and some key questions are happening in general on citizen science independent of groundwater and the role of information and data sharing in, 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 the, in the management of resources that are so complex as groundwater. Next. So we're now, as I say, at the stage of um, kind of almost launching the survey. We will want, want to let, launch the survey on the 1st of August. And I've put in bold there the Prima experts because we're actually hoping that you will help us by participating in our survey. So Manuel kindly gave us the space to, to kind of encourage you to participate. We think it's great that we're all together sharing our experiences because we think that then we will learn and go a lot faster. Uh, next. Uh, so I've put here my, my contact uh, in case you want to participate. We already approached your coordinators and they were super receptive to, to helping. Uh, just to say that, of course, we will share the results with all the experts that participate. We will, of course, share the results anyway, because it's, it's a public project. But uh, basically, if you participate, what we're going to be asking you is to reflect on these key questions uh, in, in trends in the future. So the, the timescale that we've identified, because we think it's aligned, particularly with, for example, climate change. We're going to look at 2030 because of the SDGs. It's a critical date for, for global agenda. We're also going to look at 2050. That's really important, for example, for climate change goals in the European Union and for the Green Deal. And 2100, which is when we actually think that if we don't mitigate climate change, it would actually have a big impact by then. Uh, so that's it. Just to encourage you to participate, do email me or Manuel if you want to, to help us. The more experts we have, the better the results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elena. So I think we have a few more minutes uh, for a quick uh, discussion. So if you want to present something on on this first uh, for the other Pima projects, uh, in case they, you want to mention any activity related to citizen science and other sources of groundwater information that you want to talk about, I think Jaime, you in your project. 
<laughs> no, I, I wanted to talk more more than uh, about citizen science uh, information about the fact about the synergies between our two projects, uh, the fact that uh, we are working on the same uh, case study and that but we are approaching it from different perspectives. I mean, you are using the citizen science. It, we are doing more and more, more focus on the modeling part and, and trying to improve the, the numerical model uh, we have. Uh, I think it was important. Uh, I mean, it, it happened that we are in the same institution, but uh, it's clear that uh, uh, we have uh, started a collaboration. Some of the pictures that, that you show with the stakeholders, uh, we are both uh, from the from the both teams. Uh, we went to visit the stakeholders and uh, and, and try to understand. I mean, uh, which is the feeling of uh, of the different uh, uh, people who are basically using the aquifer. How, how they feel about uh, the management of the aquifer, the current uh, uh, rules uh, uh, imposed by the water authorities, and uh, and, uh, and the different relationship between them, and uh, and also, I mean, how how they feel about uh, uh, trying to be able to to provide information because at the end, uh, our model will be um, uh, as good as the data we have to build it. So so the more data we have, uh, independently of the uh, of the of of the source, as long as it's uh, has passed some kind of quality check, uh, it will uh, certainly help us to improve our our model. Yeah, um, sure, I, I agree. I think uh, the the more data we get, and and this is our hope, no? So with the use of this citizen science approach and the mobile app, we expect to collect uh, more data and also with the greater spatial coverage and uh, it, it, it is it could be very interesting to test how this improvement in data collection will translate in better better models because I think better data could help also to have a better conceptual model so you have some reduction of uh, let's say a conceptual uh, uncertainty in your modeling and then, uh, but you ha you can have also reduction in terms of uh, parameter uh, uh, uncertainty. No, uh, it's so be interesting to see how reluctant people are to collect the data because I mean you know that in some of the, the yeah. stakeholders they said I mean you are coming here basically to punish us. I mean to control us more even more than the water authorities. And that's not the purpose. I mean yeah. the purpose is to to get a better feeling about how the aquifer works and and. And to to have a uh, basically uh, is good for everybody. It's a win-win situation yeah. for for everybody. But that's not how they are perceiving us. So it will be interesting. That's to true. See that's true. Uh, of course, we have a very strict. Uh, I think a first step is you have um, you have to have a very strict uh, privacy policy. So you have to tell the users that the data will be used for scientific purposes. But uh, of course, you don't reveal uh, private data from each user, and, 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 and also our role is not to control um, if they are uh, meeting the the rules and the requirements of the river basin authority. Uh, we are not going to punish them, as Jaime said. So, uh, and 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 there is also a process of building trust. And this That's is right. clear, no? So uh, this we have to, to go there, talk to them, visit them, and this is what we have been doing so far together with with Jaime and his team. Uh, but but it's always uncertain, so you you don't know for sure what is going to be, and it's case dependent. Also, the willingness to collaborate depends on the situation, on how well you build the trust, etc. No. Sorry, Manuel. Do you have a question for uh, Elena? Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. going to ask uh, uh, Thomas. Yeah, um, in terms of citizen science and, and Delphi, we, we don't directly integrate the citizen science projects with the Delphi because they're completely different methods and they, that would not work. Citizen science has to be really grounded on reality at a very local scale. However, the Delphi, what is helping us is um, we did a, a project internally, a workshop, where we identified what we thought was the, the most important um, kind of um, areas in, in relation to groundwater management and citizen science and the, and the trends and the gaps in knowledge. And then we're now going to basically share those kind of key questions that we ask ourselves as a consortium to all the experts, you know, um, as possible, 
ideally 200 or more experts, you know, will be, the questionnaire will be sent. And then when we get the replies, we will analyze those results. And then we have a third uh, kind of um, step in, into our work package, which is called the reference cases, where we're going to look and do kind of an analysis on 20 small cases. So then we really will try to see, okay, how is this knowledge from experts on these key trends in relation to citizen science and data um, on the basis of what experts think? You know, how can we actually then, um, how can it inform the conceptual uh, framing that we're doing for our reference cases, uh, which we think are gonna be along a spectrum of cases where it is relatively advanced in terms of the sharing of data and knowledge and cases where it is probably a lot harder. And we want to understand why, you know, what are the key issues underpinning um, the evolution on the sharing of information in relation to groundwater management. So that's how the Delphi survey is going to inform the project into the future. Um, and then once we have these 20 reference cases, they will help us position our own case studies, which are gonna go, of course, much deeper and where we're actually going to be doing modeling and citizen science for real. So that's how, how the project kind of links and these elements link together. I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we are going to go to the last thematic session. It is related to groundwater governance models. Okay. Thank you, Bea. Good morning, everyone. I will share my screen, my presentation. So you should see my my PowerPoint now. I'm uh, Daniel Sanchez Garcia. I, I work as project manager in the water resources area in Central Andalusia. And I am uh, also participating in the development of the of the Gotham project. Um, I'm going to, to talk in this fourth uh, thematic sense session on the groundwater governance. I think this is um, a common matter of all four projects. Um, of course, in, in, in our Gotham project, uh, if we want to, to propose a new uh, groundwater management system, we have to first assess what is uh, groundwater governance like currently and how we can improve this room water governance. And this, this part I'm going to, to present uh, belongs to, to one of the first work packages of the project. And uh, it is intended to, uh, to have a picture of uh, current room water governance in our three pilot sites in Spain, in Jordan and Lebanon, to identify vulnerabilities or, or things that we, we can uh, improve and try to relay these uh, results of the groundwater governance assessment with the current uh, groundwater status, chemical and quantitative uh, groundwater status. So uh, here you have the, the objective, so propose a methodology to quantitatively or semi-quantitatively assess groundwater governance, uh, uh, which could be applied in a specific aquifer or groundwater body, say the, the UE. Uh, it should be applicable anywhere, so uh, with, uh, we can say, more or less available information. It should mm, be able to compare uh, obtained results between different locations, between different aquifers. And um, as I, will, I was tell, uh, telling before, uh, uh, it should let us know what is the influence of this low water governance on the chemical and quantitative or um, quantitative status or um, I mean if this low water governance has direct effects on the chemical and quantitative status or not or, 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 or this is something not directly related so this is something we, we wanted to know to know. So uh, first of all we uh, had a look at the um, different appro approaches that we could apply for doing this uh, groundwater uh, governance assessment. So uh, one of, of the most known approaches is the, is the methodology proposed by Yorston in 1990. Uh, this is not a 
methodology uh, specifically uh, proposed to groundwater, water, but to common pool resources. And uh, among these common pool resources, we could consider groundwater. water. And uh, here on the right side, you have some of the elements or variables, uh, the methodology proposed by Yostron uh, take into account. So the user boundary, resource boundaries, congress with local conditions, distribution of costs, et cetera. So we, we finally decided not to use this, this methodology. We, we thought that it was more appropriate to, for example, for the design of groundwater user associations, but it wasn't it was so appropriate for, for our audiences. So uh, a different approach is proposed by Baradi et al. in 2016. They, they proposed four categories. To, to assess to evaluate groundwater uh, governance, uh, institutional setting, availability and access to information science, robustness of civil society, and economic and regular, uh, regulatory frameworks. And, and they apply this methodology in, in 10 international case studies. You have here on the right side these international case studies. But when you have a look at the, at the articles, you see that it's mm, rather a qu qualitative rather than a quantitative approach. And, and for this reason, we also discarded this, this approach for, for our project, for our cotton projects. So finally, we, uh, we based our methodology in this article uh, published by Foster, Garduño, Trino, Fantovi in 2010. You have the, 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 the reference. And in this uh, paper, they propose uh, a set of 20 criteria to uh, assess groundwater governance. And uh, so we base our methodology in these 20 criteria, as, as I, I am going to explain in, in the next slide. So this uh, methodology for groundwater governance assessment is based on four main categories. So these 20 criteria would be classified in these four categories. Groundwater characterization, policy, management, and operation. In groundwater characterization, we have six different uh, variables or elements we are going to uh, assess. So you have here, for example, the existence of not of basic hydrogeological map, of groundwater body aquifer delineation, if there is or there is not. Uh, if there is a, a groundwater and uh, groundwater piezometric monitoring network, and if this is functional or not, the same for the groundwater pollution as an assessment, if there is this, this assessment or not, the availability of numerical modeling for the aquifer, for the entire aquifer or, or, or part of this aquifer or not, and of course, a monitoring network for, for groundwater quality. So this is the six, the six um, elements we are going to assess for groundwater characterization. In policy, for example, if the, 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 if you have to ask for a permit to drill a water well, if there exist instruments to review groundwater abstraction, so I'm not going to, to, to read all the 20 criteria, but as you can see, um, in each category, we have a set of questions, of, of variables, of elements we are going to assess uh, to evaluate groundwater governance. In management, for example, if there is a groundwater resource guardian or agency taking responsibility of groundwater governance, if there are groundwater user association, for example, and in operation, if uh, we, we are going to evaluate if uh, participation is a key element in groundwater management, as it is in the European Union since the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, of if there are action plans um, intended to maintain or to improve the chemical and quantitative status of groundwater. So these are the 20 criteria we, we have used. And uh, uh, classified in these four categories. So for each of these criterion, you have here the, 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 the third one, the third, first criterion, for example, the existence of basic hydrogeological maps. We are going to, to do a, if you want, a simple assessment and with three 
different possible punctuations. So if this criteria, if this criterion is completely fulfilled, uh, we will give it a value of one. If this is partially fulfilled, a numerical quantity value of 0 0.5. And if, if this criteria criterion is not fulfilled, so it would get a value of zero. So that way we can uh, quantitatively assess groundwater governance, each of these criteria. At the end, what you have is, is for each of these four categories, you have a possible punctuation. Okay, if, if uh, in groundwater characterization we have six criteria, it means that we can get a punctuation between zero and six. So if the punctuation is zero, 0 0.5, 1 or 1.5, we will get a bad uh, situation. If we get two, three, four or 4.5, we will have poor or improvable if you want. And a value of five <clears throat> or six, sorry, we will have a good uh, government uh, regarding this specified uh, variable. So we are going to do this evaluation for each criterion, for each of the 20 criteria, and finally we will get a final punctuation regarding groundwater governance. So if we have 20 criteria, we will have a, a value between 0 and 20, and this is the, the classification between 0 and 5.5, we will have an insufficient uh, groundwater governance, a value between 6 and 14.5, we will have a pool of improvable groundwater governance, and between 15 and 20, we will have a good groundwater governance. Um, as you can see, it's a, it's a simple methodology. It doesn't take a long time. You, you don't have to make a study um, prior to do this evaluation, and this is something that we wanted to do. So a rather simple uh, evaluation that can be assessed everywhere and which wouldn't take one hour or two hours to do it. So once you have the quantitative results, you can represent it uh, and for different case studies. This is an example. I have invented the value. So you have example one, example two, example three. You have on the left side the possible scoring from zero to 20 and in different colors if you have a good, a poor or an insufficient groundwater governance. In this invented um, uh, graph. So you have a good groundwater governance in example one, a poor groundwater governance in example uh, two, and also a poor uh, groundwater governance in example in example three. So this is basically the the, the methodology. And as I told you uh, at the beginning, our uh, intention was to okay to assess groundwater governance and try to uh, relate this to uh, current groundwater status. So we can do a table like this. So on the left side, we have the results of groundwater governance, good, poor, or insufficient. And here on the right side, you have chemical status, good, bad, and quantitative status, good, and bad. So I'm not going uh, to, to explain each one of these possibilities, but I, I will tell you, okay, we, we can have the um, as you say, the, the, the expected result, okay, uh, it, it means if we have a good groundwater governance, we should uh, expect a good chemical status and a good quantitative status. It would be, this could be uh, translated as, okay, good uh, governance contributes to the good status of groundwater. We could have the other extreme situation, so we have a, 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 an insufficient groundwater governance and a bad chemical status and a bad quantitative status. So we could consider that insufficient governance contributes to the bad status of groundwater. But of course, you have a lot of uh, results in the middle that should be studied. You could have a good groundwater governance and a bad chemical and quantitative status. Okay, this will be possible. This is a, a summary of the of the methodology we have proposed. So the objective is to assess groundwater uh, governance. We have four categories, uh, so 20 criteria classified in four possible in, in four categories. Uh, the result could be good, poor, or insufficient, and 
once you have get the result, you would proceed to the groundwater governance, groundwater status cross analysis through the table I showed you before, and then to uh, a further characterization in some of these cases. I'm not going to 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 go into this detail in this presentation, okay? But this is something that we we are going also to to assess. So we have prepared a questionnaire. Uh, with the 20 criteria. This is, as you can see, this is an, an excellent spreadsheet. And uh, you, uh, you can see here, this is the, the first five questions or elements to be assessed with, the, with three uh, possible punctuations. And then we have added here a uh, explanation to help uh, the technician, the person, uh, filling in this, uh, this, this, this question. For example, Existence of basic hydrogeological map. If there are geological and hydrogeological maps of your aquifer, punctuation will be one. If you have only geological map, punctuation will be 0 0.5. If you don't have uh, not even basic geological maps, I mean, if you only have very general geological maps, so punctuation would be zero. As you can imagine, this is a subjective punctuation, so it depends on each person. Maybe for 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 a, a single for the for the same aquifer or the same groundwater water, two different uh, people uh, would uh, give different punctuation. This is true. This is something that can occur. But you know, when we want to do um, how to say a methodology applicable to very very different uh, geological climatic uh, data availability um, 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 about, uh, conditions so you have to you cannot go to you cannot uh, how to say uh, propose very specific um, questions very specific situations so we assume that we have uh, some subjectivity in the in the answers, but we think that the, this doesn't affect the result we are going to to obtain. So this is something that we have uh, sent to the other uh, to the other uh, Prima project um, uh, managers. And uh, so uh, here we are. I'm going to present the result for the three case studies of our project and also uh, for the case studies of the other Prima project. So in this case, uh, we have, you can see here that for two of the case studies, Azraq Basic in Jordan and Upper Orontes, Upper Litany in Lebanon, we have two different assessments. I, I number it like uh, as number one, number two. And I put it there because they have been uh, carry out by two different people. So this is a good uh, opportunity to see if this subjectivity I was talking before uh, changes all of the final results or not. So you can see 10 different evaluations and the two of the cases studied uh, evaluations carried out by two different uh, people. This is the, the, the result. So you have here. Scoring between 0 and 20. Here you have Campo de Alias in Spain, as a case in Jordan, evaluation number one, number two. Aperonte Sapelitani, evaluation number one, number two. The Kena Utiel Aquifer in Spain, Alto Guadalentin also in Spain, Costa Aquifer uh, Comacchio in Italy, Jerry Falugue Aquifer in Turkey, and Ain Tingene in Morocco. This is our 10 uh, case studies. So, first of all, only Two case studies reach clearly reach a good groundwater status. These are Campo de Dalias in Spain and a flag basin in Jordan with a value of 16.5 and, and 16. You can see here in the different colors, you have the different categories, groundwater characterization, policy, management, and operation. And the numbers in white are the actual punctuations and the maximum. For example, here we have 5.5 points over six, over total six. So in these two cases study, we would have a good chrome water government. Here, you have the results of the uh, attract basic in Jordan by two different uh, uh, people. 
and you can see that results are not so different. In one of them, we we got uh, 14 points in the other in the other 16 points or two points of difference. Uh, in the second one, groundwater assessment would be poor but very very close to good conditions, so results are not so different. In the case of uh, Lebanon, this is the two evaluations. The result we obtained uh, from two different people are exactly the same. The same punctuations, exactly the same. And uh, as you can see here, in in, uh, in the Lebanon case study and in the Morocco case study, uh, groundwater governance would be insufficient. And in, in the three cases, you know the operation. The operation category gets zero points. I remember you that uh, uh, operation uh, in, inside operation there there are two uh, criteria. One of them is public participation, so participation of direct participation of people of stakeholders of water users in the in the elaboration of water management plan. So there is no participation and the existence of clear action plan to improve groundwater status, chemical and quantitative status. And finally, in the other four studies, we have different punctuations, uh, but all of them inside the, the, the poor uh, or, or improvable groundwater uh, governance. In, in the case of the Costa Aquifera in uh, Comacchio in Italy, it's almost a good groundwater, a good groundwater governance, it's just 0.5 to good groundwater governance. So the next step would be to relate these results in groundwater governance with the current uh, groundwater status. This is something we are working uh, right now. We are working on this right now. Uh, what, uh, but I can advance something here in, in, the, in the Spanish case study here in Campo de Dalia. The result of groundwater governance is a good groundwater governance and however, this groundwater body, currently this groundwater body has chemical and quantitative uh, problems. So this groundwater body has not a good uh, chemical status nor a good uh, quantitative status. So this is interesting. So why, why we have a good groundwater governance and why we don't do we do not uh, have a good chemical and quantitative status? Of, of course, there are more variables that uh, get into this analysis is something that, uh, as I told you, uh, we are uh, working on uh, right now. So, uh, no, finally, no, 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 no. yes, I'm, go I'm going to finish. This is the, the last slide with the conclusions of, of this um, uh, assessment. So, um, we have uh, developed inside the Gotham project some methodology to semi-quantitatively assess uh, grow water governance. Uh, this methodology is based on the um, assessment of 20 criteria taken from the, 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 the paper of, of Foster and uh, which are classified in four different categories. So the result uh, of the 10 case studies uh, evaluated are uh, that we have a go good governance in Campo de Dalias in Spanish case study and in the Jordan case study, insufficient groundwater governance in the Upper Orontes, in the Lebanon case study and the Morocco case study, and a poor improbable uh, um, groundwater governance in the, in the, in the remaining uh, case studies. When assessing the results of the um, evaluation on the same uh, case study uh, carried out by different uh, people, we get quite consistent results. In the case of Lebanon, exactly the same results. In the case of the Jordan case study, only slightly different results. So this made, made, this made us think that the methodology is quite consistent. And um, the last part of this uh, assessment would be the uh, a cross analysis of the groundwater governance and groundwater stas status. That is something that we are going to develop in the next months. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I don't know if there are. Any question about uh, this methodology? Somebody wants to do some questions? Some questions?
all the rest of the comments? Okay. So I think this is the end of the webinar. So thank you for participating. And I want to say that it is of vital importance for the planet to find innovative and effective solutions for sustainable groundwater management. This is only possible with a real and effective collaboration between all the entities, actors and institutions involved. So thank you all for participating. Um, that's all. <laughs> Marco. Yes, thank you very much. Um, one second just to thank the, the organizers and the project uh, because I think you, you did a great job. And uh, I mean, it, it's very nice to see that you're exchanging between yourselves. And uh, I really encourage all the projects to, to keep this communication open uh, among them. And uh, when, whether, when, when, I mean, now the, the, the way we communicate and disseminate information has changed a lot because of the pandemic. But in a way, this has also simplified uh, the way we do it in the sense that everyone is getting used to, um, to, to, to participating from home, uh, be it the speaker or the, the, the attendees. So uh, whenever at a certain point in time uh, you, you feel that uh, you can organize this kind of joint uh, meetings, joint webinars, I think it's a way to, to make communication and dissemination more powerful. So I really encourage the, the, the projects to keep working in this direction because uh, we heard the different visions, the different technical approaches and the different work that you are do doing. But uh, uh, I mean, it, it, you're still working uh, to, to, to address the same challenges and you are doing it well. So thanks again and uh, congratulations on this, uh, this webinar and really encourage you to keep working in, uh, in this direction. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Marco, for being with us uh, for the whole seminar. Yeah, thanks, Marco, and thanks, everybody, and, as, and the organizers, uh, well, it's particularly CETACUA for, for the coordination of the webinar. It has been a pleasure to contribute to that. Yeah, I would like to thank also the, the project coordinator, the partner of the different consortium, also Marco Orlando for joining us. Um, this um, this meeting and also thank you uh big thank you to all the participants and of the meeting for uh, their activity their question and their participation in uh, on the chat so thank you all and see you soon in another one webinar <laughs>